Good morning. So, how about those Patriots? Wasn't that a great game? I loved it. That's my kind of game. Don't have to worry about the outcome. So anyway, while I was sitting there last night watching the game, I was thinking, geez, I can't wait to Super Bowl so I can get my Super Bowl sub and eat it during the game. So just a reminder, in your bulletin is a Super Bowl sub insert. Please fill that out. This is a major fundraiser for us. This helps us go on trips. This helps us do other mission projects. So please, 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 please fill it out. There's a basket in the atrium. Um, that you can put it in for after church. Or you can go online and fill it out. We're very, very up and up with the whole online thing. So anyway, the second thing is, how about that cold out there? Nice and cold? Cold enough for you? Yeah, well, and see all that snow? Well, guess what? It's almost Martin Luther King Day. That's why it's snowing and that's why it's so cold. So... Tomorrow is our open door where we offer free services to people who are really having um, tough times uh, economically. So we hope that you'll come join us for the day, help out. Um, if you could stay after church today, we do have some moving around of tables and other equipment that we could really use your help. So we'll be doing that around 11.30, 11.40. So if you could help us with that, that'd be great. So. Um, if, if you still want to donate, um, we're taking donations, or if you want to help out tomorrow, please just let me know. Thank you so much. Stay warm. Yes, uh, we have a wonderful, wonderful talent show and potluck uh, next uh, Saturday. And uh, of course, you are all invited. Uh, when, when the program development team did uh, our neighborhood uh, group meetings, there was a, a, a call for more potluck. So this is partly in response to that. And it's also uh, in response to a very uh, felt need at this time, which is uh, namely for fuel assistance for our neighbors, um, your neighbors and my neighbors. Um, so uh, we will also be collecting uh, what you could donate towards the fuel assistance fund during the potluck. So please uh, come out and uh, share and enjoy uh, the many talents of the folks here and some good food. Good morning. Uh, my name is Phil Blood, and I'm the moderator of the church. And we're in our countdown. And the countdown is two, uh, because next week, next week we have our annual affirmation. So hopefully after church next week, people will grab some uh, coffee and then come back in here, and we'll have our, uh, have our meeting uh, in the annual affirmation. But tonight, or this afternoon, about 15 minutes after the, after the service, I will be out uh, in the fellowship hall uh, with any talking about the budget and talking where we are and as you know we have some problems with our budget we're trying to figure that out you know, uh, where to go with that so I will be there with another budget uh, hearing with some information and answer questions uh, so please if you haven't already or you have already and you want to come again uh, come visit thank you We like to promote community, that is the sense of being the body of Christ. And on a day like this, I invite you to snuggle closer to one another <laughs> and to recognize that beyond even these walls, the body of Christ through our live streaming is going out to literally the whole world. So we give God thanks for that opportunity. I give God thanks for your presence here. Be alert to all that is shared because it is the good news for each of you today. And I invite you to listen carefully, to allow the sound that will fill this space to draw you closer 
to worship. and shine. I invite you to literally arise, and because I know you will shine, and share our voices found in our bulletin for the call to worship. Let us turn our hearts and minds to the presence of God in our midst. Let us turn our hearts in the face of the Holy One on this Sabbath morning. We are invited to rest in the holiness of the day. All thanks and praise be to God.
friends, I invite your shared voices in the unison prayer of invocation found in our bulletin. Let us say together one heart, soul, and voice. God, who invites us to follow, we have gathered here faithfully in search of something. We are here as ones who have been called to bear witness. Help us in this hour to pay attention and give voice to the reality of your presence in our lives. Grant us the courage to hear and receive your word, that we may be forever changed by the one who offers us infinite possibilities, if only we come and see. Amen and amen. My friends, please be seated. I'd like to invite all of the children, instead of taking a seat in your pew, to come down here. Come down to the front of the church. And while you're sitting and waiting, I want you to think about snow. I want everyone to think about snow. Just a few more people coming down. Are you imagining snow in your brain? We had to do that a few weeks ago because we didn't have any, but now we can look outside and we can see it. Just a few more people. Well, everyone, good morning. Okay, so that was not very good. Let's try this again a little bit more enthusiastically. Good morning. Good morning. Very good. So I asked each of you to think about snow. Do you know that each snowflake is unique? Each snowflake is its own thing, but can you tell that when all that snow is piled up? Or when you make a snowman? How can you tell when each snowflake is unique? Have you ever caught a snowflake in your hand? And what happens when you catch it in your hand? It melts right away. So how can you tell it how unique it is? You have to be really, really, really quick to catch a snowflake in your hand. Well, you know, snow, it's interesting because snow is kind of like us. Not that we melt when you catch us in your hand, but that we are each a unique, like the snowflakes. If you look at us as a whole big room of people, kind of like if you look at a snowbank, we all kind of are like compressed together and you can't tell how different we are. But if you look at each one of us uniquely, like each one of you, like each person sitting in this room, God has made us to be unique and individual, but you have to get those quick glimpses of how we are each unique individuals, like those unique snowflakes. Okay, so there's a point to this story, and the point is that God has made each one of you, like a snowflake, unique and special. And it's not just that God has made you, but God has also asked you to do something. So it's not just that God made you to be special, but God has asked each of you to do something special and unique with your lives. And I have a big word for you guys to think about as you go to Sunday school. Can you say vocation? Does anyone have any idea what that means? What do you think it means? Vocation is, well, we can think of it kind of that way. But vocation, it means to call. It's a job. You each have a special job because you are a unique and individual child of God, a unique snowflake. And God has called each of you to do something special. And it might take you your whole lives to figure it out. But part of figuring that out is listening and paying attention to how you are a unique child of God. So, friends, let us pray. God, thank you for making us unique and special individuals, as unique as the snowflakes 
and together as a whole to be your children, to listen for your call. Amen. You guys can <laughs> scripture this morning comes from two places. The first is Psalm 139, which can be found on page 540 in your pew Bible. I have to admit this is one of my favorite psalms. I love the idea of God as a knitter. God knitting me and you, each of us together, before we even breathe oxygen, before we even see light that God has been knitting us together. Hear these words. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. 
You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. That I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are the sum of your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, from the first chapter, page 80 in the New Testament, so the back part of your pew Bible. And this is a story of call, a story of vocation as Jesus was going out, ministering through Galilee, and gathering his disciples together. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found among him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under a fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to them, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. May God add to our hearing of Scripture this morning. Well, Caitlin, it is so good to have you with us. Thank you for sharing that. Also, thank you for the children's sermon. You know better than most how I sometimes bring the phrase God's frozen chosen to this pulpit. But now with each unique snowflake, I have a different feeling about God's frozen chosen. So thank you for that. Come back in time with me, my friends. The time is 1968. The place is Memphis, Tennessee. Elvis Presley is living in Graceland with his wife Priscilla and a newborn daughter, Lisa Marie, and he is enjoying the Grammy. He has just won for his second gospel album, How Great Thou Art. In the minds of many, he is the king. But in March of that year, another king comes to town. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. travels to Memphis, to lead a march in support of the city's sanitation workers. Some 1,300 workers, many of them African American, have been on strike for safer worker conditions, higher wages, equal treatment. Unfortunately, several militant and violent groups also join that crowd. And King announces into that crowd through a bullhorn, I will never lead a violent march. Please disperse. He 
promises to come back to Memphis in early April and to lead a march that is nonviolent. And King is good to his word. He comes back in March. He comes back again in April. And on April 3rd, 1968, even in the midst of several death threats, he comes into this place where there is great high tension. And he feels it's important to be there, to press ahead, to speak at the rally on behalf of the sanitation workers. And in the course of that address, which turns out to be his last speech he will ever give, he tells a story about an earlier time, an earlier attempt on his life that brought him perilously close to death. He wrote, you know, several years ago, I was in New York City, autographing the first book that I had ever written. And while sitting there autographing books, a woman came up. The only question I heard from her was, are you Martin Luther King? And I was looking down, signing books, and I said, yes. And the next minute, I felt something beating on my chest. Before I knew it, I had been stabbed by this woman. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon. And the blade had gone through, and the x-ray revealed that the tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta, the main artery. And once that's punctured, you drown in your own blood. That's the end of you. It came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had sneezed, I would have died. Sometime after the operation, after my chest had been opened and the blade had been taken out, and things moved around and then they allowed me to move around a little, I read the mail that came in from all over the states, all over the world. Kind letters had come in. I read a few. But one I will never forget. I had received telegrams from the president and vice president, but I've forgotten what those messages said. I received a visit and a letter from the governor of New York, but I've forgotten what was said. But there was another letter that came from a young girl at White Plains High School. And I looked at that letter and I will never forget it. It simply said, Dear Dr. King, I am a ninth grade student at White Plains High School. While it should not matter, I would like to mention that I am white. I read in the paper your misfortune and of your suffering. And I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. I am simply writing to say to you that I'm so happy that you didn't sneeze. <laughs> he goes on, and I want to say to you tonight, I want to say to you too that I'm happy I didn't sneeze. Because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't be around here. I wouldn't have been around in 1960 when students all over the South started sitting in at lunch counters. And I knew that as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best of the American dream. They were really standing up. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around in 1962 when the Negroes in Albany, Georgia decided to straighten their backs up. And whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they are going somewhere because a man can't ride your back unless it's bent. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been here in 1963 when black people of Birmingham, Alabama aroused the conscience of this nation and brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had a chance later that same year to tell America about a dream that I had had. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been in Memphis tonight to see a community rally around those <laughs> brothers and sisters who are suffering. I am so happy, he said, that I didn't sneeze. Now, it's not that King took personal credit for his survival. He felt that he had been called to do what he did. He gave all the glory to God in his autobiography. He wrote, if I demonstrated unusual calm during that attempt on my life, 
It was certainly not due to any extraordinary powers that I possess, no. Rather, it was due to the power of God working through me. Throughout this struggle of racial justice, I have constantly asked God to remove all bitterness from my heart and to give me the strength and courage to face any disaster that came my way. This constant prayer and the feeling of dependence on God has given me the feeling that I have a divine companionship in the struggle. I know no other way to explain it. It is the fact that in the midst of the external tensions, God gave me inner peace. In the course of his life, Martin Luther King Jr. walked through many dangers, toils, and snares. But through it all, he knew that God had called him and was walking with him. He believed that the Lord was the divine companion in the civil rights struggle, giving him the strength and the courage to face any disaster that might come his way. Now, I share this with you because I contend that he had the very same faith that you heard from the psalmist in Psalm 139. The ancient poet who said to the Lord, you hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful. It's high, I cannot attain it. You see, it's a calling. And we have all been called. Although life is fragile, full of danger, Perhaps, perhaps, we too can draw on the comfort of that psalm, the knowledge that God is with us, God is Emmanuel, and can and does give us inner peace. And this peace can and does give us courage and confidence, inspiration and insight serenity, and strength. Most of all, this peace frees us. It frees us up to do God's will in the living of our everyday life. Now this is important because God's peace doesn't necessarily protect us from pain and suffering. Oh no. It doesn't shield us from the hardships that come from taking bold stands for God. Oh no. In fact, the short life of Martin Luther King Jr., death by an assassin's bullet, came just one day after he gave that speech at the rally in Memphis. God's peace didn't give King a long life, but it was lifelong. It never failed him. The peace enabled him to say to the Lord, along with the psalmist in 139, I come to the end, and I'm still with you. And it made all the difference in the work for racial justice. If King had not responded to the call of God, if he had not felt the power of the inner peace, he would not have been able to organize the Montgomery boycott if he had not felt God's inspiration and insight, he would not have been able to give his I have a dream speech. If he had not felt God's call, courage, and confidence, he would not have been able to launch the major voter registration drive crusade for citizenship. If he had not felt God's call, courage, and confidence, he would not have been able to defy death threats and stand with the Memphis sanitation workers. The Lord's peace always frees us, frees us to do the work of our life. So, like Philip and Nathaniel in the gospel reading that Caitlin shared with us, 
like every Christian believer through all of time and even sitting in the pews this day, we too are called to come and see and to follow. We are called, each and every one of us. And sometimes we let our voicemail take the message. And sometimes we check out the caller ID. But you know what? Much like those pesky and persistent fundraisers, they keep getting called back. We are called and called and recalled. I know it was true for me. In my call into ordained ministry, I fought it. I denied it. I swam against the divine current for a long, long time. And that's not an unusual story. Many of my colleagues share a similar story. And I'm not just speaking about being called to church work. Oh no, I'm speaking also about your work. And I'm not just speaking about being a pivotal historical figure. Oh no, I'm speaking about your work. It's much more complex than the spectacular. It's frequently the subtle. I'm speaking about the day in, day out living of our faith. I believe that God has called you. And you. And you. Just as clearly and relentlessly as God has called me. What I don't know is what God has called you to do with your life. Well, you know what? I take that back. I think I do. I think I really do. God has called you to live gracefully. May I see the hands of all of you who have never made a mistake? <laughs> oh, Karen, put your hand down. <laughs> Living gracefully. <laughs> For those of you, hang on, because not everybody heard that, and I know that our people online didn't hear that. Linda said, when I said that to Karen, Linda said, she only made one. <laughs> Living gracefully is to let others make their mistakes without our need to punish them or to make them our enemy. We all make mistakes, even Karen. We all have deep faults. We all need grace. And those of us who are disciples of Jesus need opportunities to treat people gracefully. It's your calling and mine. Remember, there's so much good in the worst of us. And there's so much bad in the best of us that it behooves all of us not to judge the rest of us. God has called you to be generous. I know. I hear it. The news that prevails 24-7 makes us afraid and depressed about our personal and collective economy. Still, you and I aren't to put our faith in the economy. Not in our household, not in this household of faith, or in the wider world. We are to put our faith in God and to live accordingly. We are called to be generous with our time. We are called to be generous with our talents. We are called to be generous with all of our resources. Generous with our families. Generous with our friends. Generous with our neighbors, near and far. 
generous with the stranger, and yes, generous with those whom we fear as enemies. God has called you to care. See, apathy is a sin. In fact, it's one of the seven deadly sins. And although the word is often translated as sloth, it really means that shrugging your shoulders will kill your soul. God has called you to a life of compassion, calm passion, with passion, with feeling, feeling with others. I don't know what other ways God has called you. It may be like the king. It may be pivotal. And it may be substantially subtle. I don't know in what ways God has called you, but I do know that we are all called by God to live gracefully, generously, and compassionately. There may be other things that we are to do, but I'm quite clear that's part of all of our calling. This life you've been given, God's gift to you. What you do with God's gift is your gift to God. We are all called Pick up your ears, open your eyes, get your hands ready, because now, now is the day that you respond to your call. Let me hear an amen. Amen. week I've held a number of persons and situations in my prayer life. I share them with you that you might also hold them. And then briefly I'll ask if there are prayers that you too have brought with you this day. So ongoing prayers for persons who are in their respective journeys toward wholeness, for Susan Kierstad, for Annie Cote. Ongoing prayers for Suzanne Moline, Donna Goulding, for Judy Cadmus and Julia Marston, all of those with physical challenges and journey toward God's intended wholeness. For those who are particularly challenged with their journey toward wholeness with cancer, prayers for Lee and Cindy and Rebecca and Sherry and Linda, for the families that love them and share their journey with them, for the journey of mental health that Jamie may know and comfort for his wife, Nancy, 
and for the grieving amongst us, including Sandy Duros, that grief may not overcome them, but that God's presence may be known to them in their grief. Those are the prayers that I bring this morning, and I wonder, what prayers might you share? Prayers of joy and celebration, prayers of care and concern and compassion. What are your prayers this day? Happy birthday to Michael Pierre this coming Tuesday. They, they got it, I missed it. Say it again. I w wish you a happy birthday for my son Michael this coming Tuesday. Okay, okay. For Michael, that's what, that's what I want. <laughs> you know what? Prayers for Michael and, and, and that a mom should wish that. God bless him. That's wonderful. Yes, right here. Thank you for uh, praying for me for my back procedure. I feel better with that. So thanks for your prayers. Thanksgiving for the prayers offered on your behalf from this community. And know that just because you're here doesn't end the prayers. <laughs> right? We're still with you. Russ, over here with Denise. A prayer of celebration and of concern. Uh, we celebrated the birth of grandbaby number five this week, John Robert in South Carolina by Keith's <coughs> daughter, Melissa, and uh, concern that she's having uh, trouble with pain after her um, C-section this week, and she has four others to take care of in oh. homeschool, so. For a working mom, for the celebration of new birth, for the hard labor that is, even with a C-section, and now post-birth, God bless her, and for a family that cares enough to offer prayers on her behalf. Thanks be to God. I'd like to ask for prayers for my partner's mom, Maggie. Uh, she's undergoing a bilateral mastectomy tomorrow. Just, just prayers to strengthen her. And I'd also like to offer a prayer of thanksgiving. Uh, my boss, who had a, a cancer scare and has been found to be cancer free. Nice. Prayers of God's healing intent and comfort for Maggie. And for all of those who are journeying with breast cancer in the varieties of ways and stages, for our prayers on their behalf. And for those many within this congregation who have journeyed with cancer and come and give thanks for being cancer free, thanks be to God. Ron? From our web community, community we have several prayers, concerns. One is from Christy for prayers for her niece, Athea, who is struggling with, quote, bad thoughts, unquote. May she find a path for better thoughts. From Jeff Christenberry, we have prayers for Josh, Kate, and their three boys as they travel to Calcutta, India for three months of volunteer nursing work. We also have several from Jane and Rick Campbell. First one is for Dawn, who had a massive stroke and is in need of spiritual healing. Also prayers for Steph and Drew while traveling for their Nana's funeral in Pennsylvania. Thank you, Ron, and thank you to our web community for offering their prayers as well. My friends, I know there may be more, but for right now, I invite you to join your hearts. I invite you to allow the music to draw us deeper in prayer and closer to God.
holy, holy God, creator of heaven and earth, giver of life and conqueror of death. We come before you with our spoken prayers, names named out loud in the safety and the beauty of this sanctuary. We come before you with prayers of hope and promise, prayers of care and concern and compassion, prayers for the well-being of others and prayers for our own individual and collective journeys. Oh God, we hold them, speak them to you. And we come before you in prayers held in the silence of our hearts, barely able to hold them, let alone speak them. For those prayers as well, O oh God, we give you thanks that your embrace is wide enough to draw them in as well. For the prayers around which we have no words, for the darknesses and the glimmers of light that have yet to reveal the fullness of image or word, for those prayers as well, we give you thanks that you know even before a word is on our lips. Gracious God, for all that has been offered, for the opportunity we have to listen to your call and to respond with boldness of faith, for those who struggle mightily hear our prayer, for those who will serve tomorrow in this church, and for those who come in need of being served. We bring all of this before you, praying that we will be instruments of your peace, conveyors and ambassadors of your good news, all in the name of Jesus Christ, whose prayer we sing.
pieces of paper and bits of metal, even a few plastic symbols. But gracious God, understand them. They are parts of our lives, given to your glory and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Magnify them, multiply them, both in these plates and in these pews, to your service. Amen. Thank you.